We're going to open the public hearing on House Bill 1615 relative to industrial hemp, but before calling the prime sponsor, uh, I'm just going to note we have a number of people who signed up to testify. I have another, we have another bill that we have to hear after, after that. People have been waiting around for a while. We're an hour behind schedule, so I'm just going to ask if we can keep on task. That would be appreciated. Thank you, Representative Schoen. Lizzie, are we ready to go? Thank you. Chairman, I have a small amendment which I will discuss, and I've got copies here that we can get out. Thank you, Representative. And a few that have copies for our And I'll take one back just so I have one. Before uh, Representative Cohen introduces them, I actually have no one. Nope, that's not true. I have one person signed up in opposition. I take that back. Oh, so close. <laughs> so close. <laughs> I'm ready for oh. We're good to go. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it's a pleasure to be here in front of the Judicial Committee with a bill that I never thought would cross over from the House to the Senate. Um, but I'm extremely pleased it is. Uh, 1615 relative to industrial hemp would change the fact that we currently consider hemp um, grown for industrial purposes, which is not cultivation for its THC content, but for its, its plant qualities, um, and in fact does not have enough to get someone high, um, it's still considered to be a controlled substance, and this bill attempts to change that. Uh, the, the background on this, so you understand why I'm surprised that it, it got this far, is um, Representative Owen, who I believe is here, has for many years been trying to get an industrial hemp bill through this legislature and has had various successes. And finally, this year did get a resolution through the House that I believe the Senate is considering. But we really have not had much success. And um, I had the interesting experience in late 2010, after being elected, of sitting in an orientation session um, in the uh, uh, environment and agriculture uh, division uh, that they were they, they had split us up into and we did a mock hearing on industrial hemp and in that mock hearing after hearing uh, people such as Claire Ebel and uh, someone from the state police etc after hearing all the testimony the freshmen discussed the bill to get comfortable with the idea of how to pass legislation and what came out of that discussion was these freshmen said well it seems to me that what we're hearing is that the real problem is that this is on our state schedule. And in fact, the bill, as we were considering, didn't address that. And so we actually had freshmen who said, I want to modify this bill and, and change it so we remove it from the state schedule. So that was in the back of my head, that we had had this discussion and there was a different approach from what had been considered in the past. Combining that with a bill we had last year dealing with ethanol. And that bill attempted to ban corn-based ethanol for a variety of reasons. And that bill took an interesting technique. It said, we will ban corn-based ethanol if two other states from the New England area join us. That way there's enough of a, a, a mass to, to require. And I, in, in looking at a bill to put in, had these two ideas. And I said, what if I put those together? And I figured this bill would go to environment and agriculture, and who knows, we might get to it. And to my shock and, and to my dismay, the bill was sent to criminal justice. And I said, that's it, never going to go anywhere. Criminal justice is never going to take this on. And I was delighted, because criminal justice not only looked at this simple bill and said, based on the testimony, it makes sense to us, they put it on the consent calendar, that we went from industrial hemp and saying that we as a state should take a stand every period previous year it was well but that's a federal issue yeah we can't do that there's drugs etc criminal justice not environment and agriculture not any of the groups that look at the at the, the people that were the most opposed said we not only agree this isn't even worth the discussion on the house floor put it on consent so I'm pleased that this is here. You're going to hear from people that talk about all of the wonderful 
agricultural benefits of hemp. You're going to hear from people that will tell you what a great crop it is and what a, a positive thing it would be for our state. Um, this bill will only take effect if two other states join with us. So it's even a safe bill that if, if we don't do this together, it's not going to happen. The amendment that I've handed out is very simple. All it does is it removes the DEA reference that it no longer would require the DEA to notify the Secretary of State. It changes it to the Secretary of State being the responsible party. And the reason for that is, it's my understanding that we can't count on the DEA actually notifying our Secretary of State. So, so basically, it's the exact same concept, which basically it's just the trigger changes. We're no longer putting the burden on another agency. It's essentially our Secretary of State saying, yes, this, this law is now in effect because two other states have joined us. Not for the purposes of what this bill says, which is legislation prohibiting industrial hemp from being designated as a controlled substance. Most of the states that have passed industrial hemp bills, and I believe Maine is one of them, have passed it conditionally. They have said, we want to allow it when the Fed say it's okay. This is a different approach. This says no. As you heard earlier from Matt Simon, we have a state schedule and there's a federal schedule. And this says the state schedule has to change. It's a good idea. What, what do we care what other states are doing? It, I would love to go ahead and say that. But again, the idea was I was looking for something that would give people who were cautious of pushing back against the feds the ability to say we will not stand alone. With three states doing it, I think it's a lot more likely that the feds will say, OK, we give in. You can start doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I'm just going to remind members of the committee that we have we have uh, people waiting to the other here. So, so. And I will say, Mr. Brandon took all of the great testimony about the history. We heard it in the last bill, so you won't have to hear any of that. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Rowan? Uh, thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the new Representative Cohen. Uh, <laughs> my question, uh, first of all, is the definition of industrial hemp elsewhere in law I assume it must be, because it's not here. I believe the problem right now is that essentially the controlled substance, it does not make a specification. It's basically, it says hemp and marijuana. It, it's all inclusive. And the goal here is that it directs that we remove it from the state schedule. And so at that point, the issue would be when it gets removed to make sure we, we've clarified that. And it probably would be something along the lines of, um, hemp grown for industrial purposes is not included in this schedule. And so I, the, the, bill is, the bill is a little loose that way because it's the intention. Because again, uh, the exact specifications of how something gets on a schedule is not in statute, it's rulemaking authority. Follow up? Uh, could uh, plants that have a, the capability of providing the, the a marijuana be then considered to have industrial qualities, or they have the same type of fibers and industrial qualities, uh, and is that differentiation clear enough? That's a, that's a wonderful question, and in fact, that's often what law enforcement's objection to industrial hemp bills is, is we can't tell the difference. I will tell you that uh, the best analogy I've heard is that's the equivalent of someone saying, we can't tell the difference between broccoli and cauliflower because they are similar plants. And they, there is a difference. And essentially, the difference between a THC generating level is that plant has been teased. Um, that's one of the reasons that there's a cultivation factor here. It's been teased so that the females generate a, an enormous amount of the THC producing uh, uh, buds. Industrial hemp is the opposite. It's often the male plants. They're stringy. They're fibrous. They really are essentially two different kinds of plants. And, and that's really the difference here. In fact, uh, it could be argued that encouraging industrial hemp growth because you have this wild amount and you have the pollen in the air actually makes it harder to grow THC quality because the whole reason that you get the high THC is you want to keep those female plants away from the pollen. 
You want to isolate them, and so essentially they get engorged, looking for. They become more attractive. This is this is uh, the uh, the breeding, so to speak, and so. Encouraging widespread hip growth actually makes it harder to grow THC quality marijuana. Why is there some sign today? <laughs> 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 Could they even vacate this building? <laughs> um, yeah, my question is relative. You mentioned a state schedule, a federal schedule, and I, I guess that was not my understanding for, well, from what Mr. Simon said. He was talking strictly about state laws, federal laws. I didn't hear him talk about schedules. Do we have a separate state schedule and how much control do we have what goes over it? And you say prohibit industrial hemp being designated as a controlled substance. I assume you mean on our state schedule. Correct. That's all we have control over. And it's my understanding that the reason enforcement happens is because we have duplicated the federal schedule to a state schedule. So that way our law enforcement is told this is what we are enforcing. Because otherwise, you'd have to be a federal agent to enforce federal law. Our state police do not enforce federal law, they enforce state laws, which is the reason we had a decrypt bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Claire, you both. Thank you. Mr. Chair, my name is still Claire Evil. I'm still the Executive Director of the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union. And when testifying on, these, on this bill years ago, uh, people came in from the DEA to oppose it. And one of the reps asked me the size of a joint you would have to have to get enough THC from hemp. And I said about the size of a railroad tie. And it turns <laughs> out that was much too small. The reality is, if you hate mar if you hate marijuana, plant hemp, because as Representative Cohn said, it destroys marijuana. Marijuana goes away. But my testimony wants to focus for 60 seconds on the farmers in the state of New Hampshire. We are in a wretched recession that has gone on for a very long time. This is a crop that can be used for shoes, for handbags, for cloth. I have a hemp tote bag, and I couldn't find it because the dog took it. But I've had it for 30 years, and it, it doesn't have a, a string out of place. It is the most incredible fiber. It wears like iron. It is not necessarily easy to grow, but it's not tough to grow, especially in soil that is unforgiving. And I would urge you, as an economic assistance, to the farmers of the state of New Hampshire to get this off the list so that it can be grown here and it can provide a source of income and a source potentially of manufacturing hemp products and goods in the state of New Hampshire. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Seeing none, thank you very much. Let's hear from the other side, shall we? Uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, Department of Safety. How are you, sir? I'm oh, great. Thanks. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Again, my name is Tim Piper. I'm the Forensic Laboratory Director with the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Laboratory. I'm representing the Department of Safety, uh, obviously in opposition to uh, this uh, bill as it's written. Obviously, uh, a couple of points to, to, to point out with this uh, particular bill, 1615. I, I think you also need to look at the companion bill, because it was actually brought up, or a companion house resolution, which it defines what industrial hemp would be, uh, because this bill does not talk about how it de is, is defined. And that looks at 0.3% uh, tetrahydrocannabinol uh, THC, which is the main active ingredient in, in, in the marijuana. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. So what you're saying is in response to Senator Rhodes' question about how are you defining, how is this bill defining industrial hemp? You're saying that there's a separate piece of legislation that's making its way to us? There's a, it's uh, probably in commerce or agriculture and yeah. science? It's a, it's a resolution. It's a resolution. Resolution. But within that, it defines okay. industrial hemp. Um, Thank you for the clarification. So, so that's actually uh, uh, one of our, our uh, biggest uh, concerns. Uh, the, the first one I'll talk about, though, is the fact that it is also mentioned that currently THC is a uh, chemical cannabinoid. It is on the Controlled Schedule Act, Schedule 1 drug at the federal level. Uh, therefore, uh, taking it off this, uh, you know, with state legislation would be in direct uh, by, uh, conflict with the federal schedule. 
And uh, as such, anyone that seeks to grow marijuana for any purpose, they still have to obtain a DEA uh, registration authorizing such activity, uh, regardless of its uh, hemp, uh, if this legislation would pass to allow them to do that. They would still have to go through the federal regulations. Uh, in fact, there's, uh, I've, I've noted a few uh, on the handouts, a few uh, uh, court decisions that, that actually uh, basically uh, support that. I mentioned the, uh, the other issue that we have a great concern is defining industrial hemp as 0.3% THC. Um, it's also been said that you can differentiate between uh, the hemp plants versus marijuana plants, but again, uh, I've been with the forensic lab for 23 years. I started off as a drug chemist. I've uh, analyzed uh, over 10,000 exhibits of, of marijuana, from anything from charred debris, to plants, to I think I've had two uh, several time cases of marijuana. Uh, so I know how to differentiate botanical characteristics. I know how to analyze uh, the THC content. The concern is that uh, if you define it based on percentage, then uh, pretty much any case that comes uh, through law enforcement, we will have to uh, ascertain the level of THC and define it, put it in this category of industrial hemp versus marijuana. And with that, uh, obviously, uh, this is the first uh, I've been uh, brought into this particular bill uh, as of late. There is a fi uh, financial aspect of that. We will have to buy additional transportation to differentiate between THC at the low level versus uh, kind of conventional marijuana. Uh, and again, that would be upwards of uh, $200,000 for transportation. And uh, right now, we see about 3,500 uh, cases that involve marijuana. Uh, throughout our state per year, and so that's where we, we uh, I have the map broken down in uh, the handouts that I provided to you. Uh, Mr. Mark, sure. can I interrupt for just, Absolutely. Just, like, just a couple quick questions for clarification. One is, the Department of Safety presumably has something, the instruments today that can determine if the substance is, has, contains THC. Correct. And, or is marijuana. Correct. And so the issue is, we the Department of Safety doesn't have the equipment that would nece be necessary to determine the percentage of That's the correct. Equipment? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And then the second question I had uh, was, is irrelevant, uh, because I was going to say, if you have, I thought the concern that you were going to, would you believe, I thought the concern you were going to articulate was 23%, they'll just, you know, 25, uh, they'll just grow it to 22. Uh, and be sold that way, but the, then the question would be, is there a level then that you would find not offensive or threatening? Well, again, through the history of some of this legislation, obviously this has been brought forward many times before. It started off with 1% THC, and now it's down to 0.3%. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not sure what the level is. Uh, it depends on how it's defined. And regardless, if they're defining it based on percent THC, uh, some additional instrumentation would, would need to be acquired validated and uh, ready for testing for, again, differentiating between is this legal or is this uh, available? Thank you for the uh, and and uh, I know some of the arguments come up uh, that you can t differentiate in the field, uh, industrial hemp versus marijuana, the flowering tops, the buds, etc. Uh, and again, I guess I would subscribe to you that there's actually a lot of research still going on now, a lot of university levels, to look at DNA to differentiate between that. So I guess I, I would submit that if they're looking at how to differentiate on the cellular level of the DNA, then obviously there is some confusion on how to uh, differentiate between uh, marijuana or industrial hemp. And a lot of that research would not need to be taking place if, in fact, you could uh, tell uh, either at the macroscopic or the microscopic level. I, I just have, I, I have a, first of all, your question is from members of the community. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, mine's a procedural one, and I'm, so I'm going to wait until the entire room. So please go ahead if you have a question. For... Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks for your testimony. Um, from what I read, other countries, the way they get around the issues that you're talking about in terms of having to test everything you see is um, they license hemp, hemp growers. And in that case, you could only uh, go to those places, test them. That would be a very limited number. And then everybody else you're going to presume is marijuana if you, if you find it anywhere else. It's, would that be something that would greatly reduce uh, any financial burdens? And, and again, that was uh, previous year's legislation that included that. And that's why I was a little you know, surprised at how broad this, uh, this year's uh, legislation did not include any of those uh, 
you know, stipulations and, and registration and fields and uh, those types of uh, so regulations on who can grow it. Sorry, sorry. And then well, just to follow up, and, and, and do you agree with the previous speakers that, um, you know, if you had real hemp with the low THC, that that would inhibit marijuana growth? You couldn't hide other marijuana plants, THC producing marijuana plants within your hemp field, for example. Well, um, I would disagree with that. Uh, other states, uh, I know Hawaii, they have had some issues where they've had out, you know, they, they can actually have large enough fields where they can actually have little uh, pockets uh, and, and still grow that. Um, still grow some uh, marijuana. Uh, and again, the, the, the toughest thing is in the industrial hemp is regulating the percent THC. And again, there's ongoing research for that to try to reduce the amount of, of the syzolithic and pubescent hairs that generate the THC resin balls. And again, we're not at the, obviously at that stage uh, yet. So uh, ongoing research is going on with that. Uh, but again, it comes back to the number one argument, which is that it's still on the uh, federal Control Substance Act as a Schedule One drug. Anything that produces THC, and so any any level uh, is considered to be a Schedule One drug at present. Can I just can I interrupt and yes. ask the, the clarification question because we've been dealt with this a lot today. If it's take if New Hampshire takes its off takes THC off of its schedule off of Schedule One, the feds can still prosecute residents in New Hampshire, but it's the state that can't prosecute people. In that's correct. Thank you. Senator Grove, did you have a question? Okay. Senator Forsyth, did you have a That was my question, thank you. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Are there further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for your submission. Um, Greg Polowski? Mr. Polowski. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Greg Blouse, Hamlet, and an organization called New Hampshire Common Sense. And I have here a few letters of support for various uh, state organizations around the state, such as the New Hampshire Grange, um, also um, New Hampshire Students for Sensible Drug Policy, as well as New Hampshire Common Sense. Uh, there are a few other letters of support, phone calls that your office has been receiving lately from the New Hampshire Agriculture Commissioner, Lorraine Merrill, as well who is in support of this particular bill specifically for reasons that are beneficial to the state of New Hampshire. Um, and I was going to make a statement versus what the Department of Safety had just mentioned, that, but it was already just noted by you, is that law enforcement is basically derived off of to, uh, enforce laws for the state of New Hampshire, not federal law. So, you know, state police officers who are going through fields of, uh, of industrial hemp you know, they're not going to be enforcing federal laws. They're going to be enforcing state laws. So you guys are going to be creating regulations and administrative rules that are pursuant to those particular things. However, if I can touch base, off, touch base on what the DEA regulations are for industrial hemp currently right now, it is 0.3% TAC levels in a particular seed that is gone through and scientifically measured before that seed is even brought into the country. Um, the United States currently receives 75% of the world's industrial hemp through, you know, coming through our borders, most of it being uh, uh, delivered through Canada, China, and other states or other countries in, in Asia. These are jobs, and this is growth that people in New Hampshire can, can, can use. Uh, the usage of uh, industrial hemp being manufactured on one acre of land can produce 30 barrels of oil. Could you imagine our dependency on foreign oil as being diminished based off of our ability here in New Hampshire to grow industrial hemp to the quality that would be able to produce a gasoline at a far cheaper rate than what corn ethanol products can be based off of. So those are just some of the, the uh, implications that industrial hemp has here in the state of New Hampshire. The farmers that I've talked to over the past couple months in getting these letters of support have all said the state of the exact same thing, that they would be benefici beneficiaries from legislators such as yourself to allow for industrial hemp to be grown here in the state of New Hampshire. It would allow them to diversify their crop fields as well as save a lot of money and make quite a bit of money. Um, there are obvious issues with the DEA, um, such as having 24-hour security, and everybody has to be fingerprinted, they have to have um, a gauge uh, protected uh, field around it. Um, the 
EPA fee to grow industrial hemp is incredibly high at $4,000 a year per year per farmer. Not too many farmers can afford $4,000. You know, but I mean, there are some serious, serious restrictions for the DEA. You guys here are trying to talk, determine whether or not industrial hemp can be a, a, fees, a, a viable crop here in the st state of New Hampshire. The folks who are going to come behind me are going to be able to outlay, outlay all that for you. This is an incredibly, incredibly beneficial prop, uh, plant, not just for the state, but for anyone who has gluten, uh, gluten issues, who are, are autistic. There, are, there is research out there that shows that you know, this plant is incredibly, incredibly beneficial. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Well, um, I'll leave these letters here with you. I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Other questions? Uh, See none. Thank you very much. I have a question for Susan, which is the specter of a fiscal note was raised to make a determination about the percentage level. Uh, what would we do with this uh, issue with that issue? Procedurally. Procedurally, you can note in the floor remarks to the chair of finance. <laughs> you have a question, the bill does not have a fiscal note, does it? No. That you have a question and they can take it to finance and look at it? Determine whether or not it's, there's a fiscal note. Okay. Yeah, but there's, it can't grow a fiscal note if it didn't start off with one, even though it can grow a fiscal impact. Nor can it get rid of a fiscal note if it started off with one and lost its fiscal impact. Yeah, well, I think this could take one now. You are what you are. You need that for us. We are not. We are not. Yeah. Different now. We can sit in finance. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, Jennifer Hall, we have your students for sensible drug policy. Hello, thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I will try very, very hard to keep this brief. Today, I know you have a lot of other Thank things to get much. with, um, but I just wanted to touch on a couple things. I have an economic feasibility report for industrial hemp in New Hampshire. Um, I only have one copy, so I'm pretty confident that you can copy, copy that there. up. Um, that another student and I worked on. I'm a senior at UNH this year. I'm an environmental and economics major at UNH um, and have spent a lot of time studying botany and studying a lot of the agriculture in the state and how much trouble we're in right now. And hemp is a really crazy crop because it is so environmentally beneficial as well as economically feasible. There is such a market, as Greg was just saying, and a lot of the hemp that is used and consumed in the United States is imported from all of the countries that are allowed to industrially produce it today. So we're missing out on not only the big jobs, with manufacturing, all of the farmer opportunities, but also a chance to have these products available and cheap um, for the people in our country. Um, and there are millions and millions of applications for this plant. Actually, the word uh, cannabis has come from the Latin word cannabis. Cannabis that covered all of our wagons, that was on all of our ships, that was all made from hemp. Um, it was so historically important um, when we founded our nation that it was said by George Washington himself to be planted from sea to sea. We needed it everywhere. It is what made us win wars. It is what kept us alive in a lot of ways. There was a big push in World War II, not to go too much into history again, I know you've heard all of that, uh, but there was a big push to grow hemp, having farmers grow it to help us win World War II, which is pretty significant because of its current status. Um, so just a couple things to touch on beyond that. Um, the conversations we've been having about uh, hemp and marijuana being grown in the same place that cannot happen botanically because they are so similar of crops when two plants that are planted next to each other, one being a high CHC variety and one being a low THC variety, when they go to pollen, they cross pollinate and the THC variety is cut in half. So the THC that would be extracted from a marijuana plant, from the flowers of that plant, which is useless on a hemp plant because you don't, you don't use the flowers in any sort of fiber preparation and any sort of um, the, the outside of the plant can be used as like a wood pulp um, substitute um, or any sort of wood chip substitute in that same way. Um, and the seeds obviously come from the flowers, but the flowers are not used. And those flowers are the same thing that is called marijuana today. So they are two separate things and they ruin each other if they're planted next to each other. That's most important with outdoor growing operations, obviously. 
um, because if we really wanted to eradicate all of the illegal outdoor marijuana growing operations that happen across the country, not too much in New Hampshire, but across the country, all we would need to do is spread hemp seeds everywhere. And it would cross-pollinate and ruin every harvest that any illegal grower was, was making. Um, just a couple other things. The crazy thing that I found, that I learned about hemp that blew my mind, is the way that it's planted. So when law enforcement say that they have a hard time distinguishing between marijuana and hemp, I, I don't really believe it because when you're growing a, a marijuana plant, you need to give it you know, at least three feet for it to grow big and wide so that it gets enough sun to produce good flowers. When you're growing a hemp plant, you plant them inches away from each other so that they grow really tall and really strong because the length of the fiber within the plant determines the strength of the fiber. So we can make nice silks and nice fabrics from longer fibers that are grown from plants planted very, very close together. So if you're looking at a field where all of these plants are inches apart from each other, I think it would be pretty easy to distinguish that as a hemp field rather than as a marijuana crop. Um, needless to say, the, the cross-pollination as well. Um, trying not to go over what other people have already said. Um, I mean, I would just say one last thing too, that you know, New Hampshire, our state constitution, Amendment 10, says that we have the right to disregard federal law and nullify anything that we see as not fit. I would think that this would be a proper application of that because this is something that could save the farmers of New Hampshire. Hemp would be completely viable, and that's all outlined here, so I won't waste your time today going through it, but completely viable as a crop up here. It's very cold hardy. It does very well in, in dry and wet climates, and it would be exceptional if we can take the time to invest in the infrastructure to grow it, harvest it, and manufacture it in state, and there's a lot of job creation uh, that can happen from that. And I'll wrap it there so that you guys Thank can you very much, Ms. Hall. I appreciate that. I have a question for Ms. Hall. Senator Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Hall, uh, I had asked earlier about the definition of industrial hemp, and it sounds like you've studied this quite a bit. What would, how should we define this to make it very clear what it is and what it is not. Yeah, it's, it's a hard question. And the THC level has been the standard that the other states have gone by. And it has some value to it because, you know, THC is not part of what's being harvested in the hemp plant. But the style in which it's grown and the way that the plant is harvested would be the way I would suggest that it be separated. But you kind of have to understand the plants to understand how that would even work. Because marijuana is only the flower bud of a cannabis plant. Hemp involves all of the, the um, rootstock, which can be used to make a lot of um, essentially plastics and other things that we could press out of it, oils in that way. And then you have the stock, which is made up of a hard outer shell that can be used for wood chip. Um, that can be pressed into ethanol. Then you have the long strings and the inside core of the of the plant. Those can be used for all of the fibers and all of that. And it's it's essentially comparing a plant to a flower, but they grow on similar plants. So like I don't know if that would even be a good way to separate them. I don't know that I have an answer, but the THC content is is a difficult way to to separate it because you know as we heard it it takes extra like technology to be able to determine the percentage of, of THC in that. But I mean, just also noting what Greg said as well, any um, seed stock that is used in the United States today in other states that grow industrial hemp, that's all imported from other countries that are allowed to produce industrial hemp seeds because we're not allowed to do that. So they're even, you know, Maine where they have industrial hemp, they're not able to produce their own seed stocks. They have to import them every year. So I don't know if the THC content is the best way, but I guess right now it's the simplest way that we have to differentiate the two. I would argue though they're different in the way that they're used, so it should be more obvious than we make it somehow. So I, I don't even know if that really helps, but thank you. <laughs> Other questions for this time? Yeah. Are there any uh, I'm still looking at some stuff here. Okay. Some of the other countries, so like looks like France is the biggest producer. France is a big one, yeah. Canada, Australia right. are both very large. Are there any economic studies of those countries where obviously it's 
I don't know if that's included in here. Um, yeah, we, we touched a little bit on the Canadian one in here, because um, they, they've done a lot of recent studies, specifically because they're right on our border. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly where to find them, but I know that there exists some for East Canada. Um, I would imagine Australia probably has some, because they have, in the past five years, undergone like a big hemp revolution to stop deforestation for their paper industries because they were cutting out all of you know, the woods down there and make paper and then realized that they could be growing a crop instead of cutting down trees that take you know, tens of years to, to grow right. and get you know, a, a much bigger harvest off every year. Right. Um, so right. those would be the two countries that would kind of point you in the direction of to find right. that. But this is um, based off of a Pacific Northwest one that was done for Oregon and um, Washington out there. And, and a couple other ones too that we kind of included because they're similar climates to what we have here for, for growing. Right. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any questions? So you know that they very much. Yeah, absolutely. And I just also before I leave wanted to mention my nice hemp pants that you can <laughs> 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 get. So. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> regulatory systems for there's the state and the federal the feds uh, I keep hearing about importing seeds so I'm assuming that this, does the federal government allow the growth of hemp? The federal the state's government allow hemp growth harvesting as an agricultural there is a uh, basically a registration process that you have to go to do that and at present I'm not sure if they ever uh, what the process is with that in certain New England I'm not aware of that Okay, so let me ask a follow-up question. So a state could it create a system with presumably different or lower thresholds for growth and yeah. But might we, and this is, might we be setting up growers for, to be subject to federal regulation? Correct. You would. You would still have to go through the DEA presently. The uh, must obtain a DEA registration in order to um, grow what, whatever referred to as industrial hemp. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm looking here. It, it looks like Vermont and North Dakota have passed, um, I'll just read verbatim, have passed laws enabling hemp licensure. Both states are waiting for permission to grow hemp from the DEA. Correct. Correct. Okay. So it's, it, it's, a DEA, it's at the DEA level then to get that. Okay. That's right. Uh -huh. Just a follow up. So does the DEA ever grant these? I'm not aware. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I don't have anyone signed up to speak, but I want to I can say one thing just that I thought of when we had the conversation that I think might help for the question of how do we distinguish industrial hemp versus versus the GAT one. Um, for a brief for a I, I, this will this will be this will be all of all of fifteen seconds. Given the discussion we had in the previous bill about a half an hour. Perhaps the answer might be a half an ounce is okay if we're going to decriminalize it. If we're going to have industrial hemp, you have to grow a ton or more. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, I just. I, ha I didn't suggest that you have been patient. I just don't have your name written down yes, as wanting to speak. <laughs> That's fine, Representative. If you'd like to speak, we'd like to hear you. Thank you. I'm just saying I'm not ignoring you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Representative. I want to hand down. I have to be somewhat careful that uh, previous speaker's excellent presentation. If I had her on board, say, 18 years ago, I'm just pointing out that she'll take your stuff. Okay, thank you. That's a pretty good summary. It includes about uh, 35 or so uses of hemp. Uh, the issue here is not whether hemp is any good or we can, that we can't use it. It has multiple uses, quite a, quite a, a wide variety. But the strongest fiber known to man. The problem is, as the uh, bill states, is the uh, designation 
there is a substance, it's, uh, whether the substance abuse of uh, class five is, I'm not sure of the numbers. But in the bill that we brought forth uh, a couple months ago, the resolution, and it's been referred to here, it does talk about, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'll read some of this, uh, has to do with the designation. Whereas, Congress never intended to prohibit the production of industrial hemp when restricting the production, possession, and use of marijuana, the legislative history of the Marijuana Tax Act, where the current federal definition of marijuana first appeared, shows that the industrial hemp farmers and manufacturers of industrial hemp products were assuaged by the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Commissioner Henry J. Anselm, who pr promised that the proposed legislation bore no threat to them. They are not amply protected under this act, but they can go ahead and raise hemp just as they always have. So the real problem here is that too many people think that <coughs> hemp and marijuana are the same thing, and they are not. You've heard testimony. They're grown. Amazingly different. Several years ago, we had a person testified against the growing of hemp, and he was rebutted by a person who said, he can't tell the difference between hemp and marijuana, he shouldn't have that job. And that was a, a small town policeman. And it's a fact, as the previous speaker said, they're not planted the same way. They're not harvested the same way. They're two different crops. Representative Owen, would you believe, I'm sorry to interrupt, but would you believe that, that I think the committee recognizes that they're two separate crops? Good, that's uh, great. That, there's, that they're related enough that a distinction needs to be made at some point in time, and that's an issue of uh, whether or not we have equipment currently, the Department of Safety has equipment currently to make that determination, as the House has suggested the cutoff. Yeah. So, so this committee, I don't think, uh, I mean, I can't speak for the, the committee but my sense is that they're not opposed to agricultural growth of hemp, mm -hmm. provided that we're not setting up New Hampshire residents for, for jurisdiction under two systems with two different standards. Now, we may make the decision that we're willing to do that in New Hampshire and let people run the risk on the federal level, but that's what we want to focus on for this bill. Not the history of hemp, because I understand okay. it's a long and tortured one, uh, but more about why it's okay to take that risk or why it's not. That's all. Well, and my biggest, the committee, yes. I, okay. yeah. my biggest concern is that it's placed on uh, <coughs> as, uh, as I say, substance abuse. Hemp is not a substance abuser because it's not marijuana. It's simple. So therefore, you wouldn't have all the trouble with growing it. The state police do not have tests on the leaves if they had to. But it's not very long. Thank you very much. I don't, I don't need to convince you that. that it should be, you should be convinced it doesn't belong on the substance that you said that. Thank you. Are there questions for Representative Lowe? And I'm a farmer, and I look forward to growing it as a small crop. My wife's family farms, and I, I, as soon as someone says agriculture, my ears get all tuned in and plugged in. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't they're going to grow hemp. Uh, I, just, I promise you. I'm sensitive for those. If your ears grow hemp. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> With that, we're going to close the public hearing on um, House Bill 1650. Right. Yeah. <laughs>